everyone. Welcome to the Phytology site. We've been developing this project for the last three plus years. Um, it's been a very slow process, mostly due to the need to find a suitable site to host a project like this on. Um, the criteria being somewhere that uh, a project like this could hopefully be useful. Um, what we've done is develop a, a meadow culture of medicinal plants, commonly known as weeds. Plants that are common to the streets of London, like weedy weeds, that have an ongoing medicinal value. Um, the reason it has taken so long to generate and sort of situate is looking for land. Trying to find land within London to do a project that is ideally a long-term project is actually quite challenging. We really wanted to make sure that whatever we invested time and resource-wise could actually develop and grow over time, not just be a, a pop-up instant, instant project. And also the philosophy of allowing things to take time, being a really, really important element. Basically, the Phytology project is um, the sum of many parts and the sum of many people, philosophies and approaches, aesthetics. Um, it's very kind of hard to categorize in a way. Um, what this first conversation is about is really talking about how the sort of certain elements came about. I'm going to introduce the sort of genesis of the idea and then my collaborator Talia Baldwin will talk about her role as a visual artist developing botanical illustrations to communicate visually what we're growing and my other collaborator Peter Giovannini um, who's an ethnobotanist talking about the logic and the process of deciding what plants would be grown. The Phytology project basically kind of generated in my mind about 20 years ago when I was studying art in Australia and I went on a botanical weed tour of a very urban industrialized area and the ethnobotanist was talking to me about plants, common plants that I, I'd never seen before that were invisible basically, to me anyway, and how they could be practically used as food and medicine. And what it really did was activated a perceptual shift of the role of the city and, and, and how the city can actually provide a lot of incredible things that we're not really tapping into in a way. Um, which you know really comes to, to form here in the Bethnal Green Nature Reserve. And essentially the, the tour I went on just changed my perception ever since. You know, I'd walk around and I'd see dandelion, for instance, or plantain, and I'd think, okay, well, that's a viable food source, or that's a medicinal source. Um, and it just sort of kept on gestating as I've been living in urban kind of environments for you know, over 20 years now. And I guess coming from the country originally, I'm really struck with the idea of how to make a link between my background, a rural background, to my current present urban existence and looking at ways we can use cities in different ways as well. How to generate food, how to develop alternative green spaces, um, how to facilitate social engagement in a way that's a bit more, um, I don't know, hands-on, a bit more immediate, not so academic or insincere in a way. Um, and food, food is a really useful way to do that. You know, everyone eats. It's a really common thing. Everyone needs medicine at a, one time or another. And if you can actually learn about the process of growing or, you know, food as medicine, um, it has a really subtle but powerful effect on your relationship to the space you live in. So in a sense, these ideas have culminated in the Phytology Meadow, which is situated in the far corner over here, which if you haven't seen, go and look at. It's also um, intentionally sort of unremarkable to look at. You could easily look over it if you didn't know what it is. And I'm kind of interested in the idea of if you actually know what you're looking at or if you give it the time, a lot more can be revealed, um, which Peter and Talia can talk about in, in greater detail. The site itself is quite interesting. It used to be a medieval market garden for plants that were used for food and medicine. And then in the 17th century, I think they built a, a church on this footprint called St. Jude's, the saint of lost hope, lost causes, interestingly enough. In 42, it was bombed and destroyed. And when you look around, especially in the woodland section, you can see bits of rubble from the church. And there's a small wall made out of church blocks near the medicinal meadow that you can use as a seat. Um, 
There was a glut of churches in the area. There's about six in the square miles. So when they rebuilt the area, they didn't bother rebuilding the church. They just focused on the school and the estates around here. So as a result, a lot of biodiversity started to develop. And so did a lot of rubbish from human kind of fly tipping and the likes. So they put up this massive fence in the 1980s. What the fence did was it kind of made the site invisible to a degree. It kind of stopped people accessing it, but it allowed a lot of botany and a lot of sort of uh, mammals and invertebrates to move in. In the 90s, it was given a different name from St. Jude's to the Bethnal Green Nature Reserve, which plays, you know, <coughs> language is powerful. So by calling it a nature reserve as opposed to this derelict empty site, it started to activate people's perception of what it is and how it could be used. We're recently new sort of custodians to the site and we're trying to really take it back full circle to the medicinal field and of nutritional and medicinal weeds. At this point I'd like to introduce Talia to talk about her process working in this collaborative way as, a, as an illustrator and visual artist. Okay, so I have been in quite an irregular situation for the duration of this project because I live in West Yorkshire. So I've worked on the entire project from a little village in the middle of nowhere. Um, and that has been odd for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because the whole essence of phytology is that it's a project about collaborative practice. It's a project about what happens when people come together to make something that is more than the sum of its parts. Um, and yet here I was working with a whole group of people, most of whom I had never met. Um, and the other reason that it was kind of strange for me initially was because it's a very London project. It's about urban nature. It's about things that cling to survival in really, really built up environments. And it's about kind of the acts of harvesting and growing and seeding in a non-agricultural setting. So I had a big moment in the initial stages where I thought maybe I'm failing somehow on some fundamental level because I'm trying to do this from somewhere that's geographically really far away. And what I actually need to do is find a way to move to London for a few months and be on the site and meet the people and make the work here. And then as I thought about it more, I realised that what I was going to have to do for my own sanity was to think of myself as somebody who could bring something new to the process because I'm completely uninitiated. So I'm not only geographically about as far away as you can be within the UK, but also I'm not a botanist. I don't have a background in botany. Um, I don't even have a garden. I, I buy plants from the garden centre and I water them a bit and then they die. And that's, that's, that's essentially my experience of, of plants. But I think, I think there's a difference between not having experienced something and not having a relationship with it. And for a while I thought, you know, maybe I'm the wrong person for this job. And then I realised that I do have a relationship with plants. In fact, it's quite an intense one. It's just not an expert relationship. And actually, drawing plants is something I've always, always, always done. Um, and I think, for me, the time when drawing is most interesting is when it's a process of discovery and I'm drawing something that I know very, very little about. And um, again, I started to tell myself these things. I don't know, I don't know how true they are but I told myself that I was some kind of ambassador for a wider cultural response to nature and that I was representing all the other people in London who walk past these plants every single day and don't know what they are, don't know what they're for, and certainly don't know that they have medicinal properties that, that can be used. Um, so what I did is something that I quite often do in the drawing process, which is that I drew first and then I thought about it later. And that, that maybe sounds odd, but I find that the actual action of drawing for me is quite soothing and almost mesmerizing. Um, and, and as I'm engaged in the act of doing it, then the ideas start to come and I start to get an understanding of why I'm doing this thing. Um, so it was only after I'd been 
involved in the drawing process for quite a while that I started to realise exactly how meaningful this project was going to be in terms of my own practice because as a freelance illustrator I tend to work quite intensively in short bursts and also not necessarily on things that interest me to be honest that this was a real chance for me to work quite in intensively and for quite a long time on something I'm actually really interested in and part of the reason for that realisation is that almost all of my drawings are about um, unloved things really or things with bad PR and in, in the run up to phytology I'd done a whole load of drawings of London pigeons, the scabby ones that have toes, toes missing and the gammy eyes and my husband who is Lancashire born and bred said why don't you draw racing pigeons you know they're so they're so noble and beautiful and there's this great northern heritage of of pigeon racing and it could be really beautiful you could go to pigeon clubs and do portraits of people's birds and I, I, I was kind of quietly horrified by that idea because racing pigeons have great PR already they're noble and they're beautiful and they're proud and there's quite a rich cultural history of them being represented in fact I've got a beautiful painting at home by a guy called E.H. Windred whose life's work was painting racing pigeons and what what I wanted to do was I guess the crux of it for me is making the invisible visible so I'm not interested in drawing stuff that is already represented I'm much I'd much rather draw things that other people don't necessarily think are worthy of representations and I kind of thought a little bit about um, Dutch genre painting which you know like the Vermeer paintings of um, of maids and servants and kitchen scenes and that being one of the first points in Western art history where the ordinary was seen as as worthy of being painted you know it, it's not a religious scene um, it's not a very expensive horse, it's not um, royalty or aristocracy. It's just ordinary, inconsequential things, and that, that was what really interested me um, about making this work. And in the beginning, I always knew that I wanted them to be monochrome drawings, but I found it quite hard to articulate why. Um, <laughs> I've never been much of a colourist in my work. I, I know a lot of artists to whom colour is kind of the be all and end all. And to me, I've always used a really restricted colour palette. And with the phytology drawings, I realised it was something to do with it being a modern, it, it's a latter day project. It references art history and botanical illustration. But I really, really didn't want to be doing drawings that were pastiche and were just kind of mimicking of that all those beautiful, beautiful botanic illustrations that you can see in, in old books. So I kind of thought, well, if I use a biro, it is necessarily a modern exercise because it's, it's cheap and it's disposable and it's readily available and it didn't exist a hundred years ago. So I'm, I'm gonna do all the drawings with this one biro and I even wrote to Bic I wrote to their head office and went, hey, you know, you're going to be amazed. I'm doing this whole body of unique bespoke work with this one biro of yours. And I thought, oh, you know, maybe they'll sponsor us or something. And they wrote back from their head office six months later to say, it, the, their head office was in France and they basically said, um, no. <laughs> and that, that, was, that was the end of that. Um, the point when it became really tricky was... Um, towards the end of the summer when things started to die back and I suddenly in my infinite naivety kind of it hadn't occurred to me that in winter stuff dies and then you can't draw it anymore so there was a kind of late autumn wild panic to go around and forage for things be before they were gone and you know wild garlic for example I just completely missed the boat it grows in spring and it's really lush and beautiful and then suddenly it's gone and, and I missed it. So I then had to wait almost a whole year before it grew back and I could draw it again. Um, and Michael and I, I once thought, okay, I need, I need to come down to London to forage here and see what's here. Michael and I went for a hilarious walk around Hackney, like two very elderly Panic. tourists with our field guide, <laughs> peering into corners going, well, can you get it? Can you reach that? Um, so 
I mean, I, so it, it's just been an immensely, immensely enjoyable process, and I've learnt an absolutely enormous amount, but I think, I think it's a rolling thing. There's, there's never going to be a point, I don't think, for any of us where we will feel as though we've learnt everything there is to learn. I think, I think the interesting thing as well is that Talia isn't coming from a botanical illustrator's point of view, which was an intentional, intentional thing on my behalf anyway. <coughs> She wasn't aware of the rules, per se, and in a sense, I think what she's created is a body of really fresh work. Um, uh, yeah, so at which point I'll introduce Peter. Um, Peter is an ethnobotanist that I sort of found about three or four years ago. Yeah, some time ago. Yeah. And we've had this ongoing dialogue, and many things have sort of happened in the, in the kind of process, but um, Peter basically sort of came on board and really guided us as to what we should grow and um, we've really sort of taken up his sort of suggestions and in a way it's then informed everything from Tal's drawings to what we have today. So, um, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, a uh, few years ago I just received this email from uh, Michael suggesting uh, this, this idea for a uh, project of medicinal plants in London and involving uh, artists and botanists and, and basically trying a way to communicate to a, water, uh, a wider audience um, some of the properties of some medicinal plants. And um, it sounded an, an interesting idea and then we brainstormed a bit together and, um, and basically we come up with um, this concept of choosing plants that are uh, basically a bit growing everywhere, especially uh, as well in urban environment, uh, uh, very common to find here in UK. The main idea uh, basically is I mean, to challenge perception of things that are currently seen but uh, overlooked. And, um, and that's basically was one of the main, main criteria that I use it to select the plants that have been uh, uh, cultivated on the, on the meadow. So there are really things that you see everywhere, like plantain. You, you have uh, several plantago just growing here on our feet. They're really adapted to, to thrive in human disturbed habitats, so it's, it's very easy to find them uh, even in, uh, in the cracks of pav pavement around many cities around the world. So in, among many of the plants labeled as weeds, we find actually a lot of edible wild plants so for example the, the leaves of nettle many of you will probably know that you can actually cook it when you cook it they're not anymore uh, uh, stinging and and then you can um, actually make a soup with some um, with them uh, chickweed I, I've seen them selling in the farmers market in London actually so very popular uh, again. yeah and uh, things like dandelion on the leaves as well you can use it in salad and uh, very rich in micronutrients. There's porcelain, Portulaca oleracea, which is, I think it's quite amazing because it has very high content in omega-3. Uh, uh, I think it's the, the plant with uh, the highest uh, content in omega-3. And um, it could be actually considered a superfood from this point of view. And I've seen it growing everywhere. I've seen it growing in the, in the pavement of, of Rome. I've seen it growing as well, actually, in the Amazon, in a place where uh, uh, indigenous people had uh, basically cut all the vegetation and made a land strip to land uh, small plains. And the only plants that was growing on this land strip, it was just this um, porcelain. So really amazing to see the same plant growing in the pavement of uh, a place like Rome and then mm. in the Amazon, basically. Um, so a lot of these plants are actually edible. Many of them can contribute to micronutrients. In Mexico, I've seen campesino basically uh, gathering some of these wild uh, herbs from their uh, cultivated uh, uh, corn fields and, and use them as part of their diet. They are called quelites in Mexico. And uh, a few researchers have done studies and they showed that they're a really good contribution to the diet of rural people because they have um, lots of micronutrients that actually are really good in diets which have a lot of macronutrients, for example, a lot of carbohydrates, but not that many vitamins. It's interesting, like 10 years ago, I read a paper written by 
scientific paper written by two ethnobotanists. And this paper basically was uh, looking at the uh, pharmacopoeia, the, the medicinal plants used by indigenous, by a group of indigenous people in Mexico and uh, the na Native Americans uh, in North America. And by looking, analyzing this, um, this data, they basically found that uh, there were a lot of weeds in, in these medicinal uh, floras and much more that they would expect if the distribution was uh, random, basically, in the flora. So quite intriguing. And um, they came up with two possible explications for this. So the first one is that probably there's a bias in the way people select uh, and explore medicinal plants in their environment. They probably tend to look uh, more the things that grow uh, near them so that they are more accessible. So it's, it's more likely that this, this bias of people will find more medicinal plants in, in weeds and things like this because they are plants that are more accessible that they will grow nearer so they will be easier to find. But the other, which I found as well very interesting explication that they gave to this um, finding, is basically that uh, if you think about the biology of weeds, these are plants they are very good at outcompeting other plants, and some of them outcompete other plants by using um, allo allelochemicals, so chemicals that they release that would inhibit the growth of other plants. And so some of these chemicals can actually have uh, pharmacological properties that can uh, be useful for medicinal purpose. So this is one potential reason why we could find more active compounds in, uh, in weeds. The other uh, reason related to their biology is basically that plants, because they, are, they have to stay in one place, they cannot move like animals, they have to find a way to survive, to defend themselves without moving. So they have evolved two, two ways to do that. One is basically to, to develop structures that are resistant to predators. So for example, if you have a tree, the bark is resistant. You know, it's a, a structure that is a linear structure will not be easily um, eaten. But for herbaceous plants like weeds, herbal plant, uh, uh, animal plants, uh, they much more evolved other type of defenses such as uh, basically uh, producing some compounds, usually are called secondary compounds, and some of these uh, secondary compounds um, can as well have a bi uh, biological activity that can have a, a medicinal effect. So that could be another reason why we, we found so many uh, medicinal plants among weeds. Once again, it's like that perceptual shift. Antibiotics are becoming problematic to a degree and looking at alternatives for that. Well, what do we do? Do we go back to plants? Do we have that knowledge still? Where is that knowledge? And how do we go about making sure that knowledge is reinterpreted and, and made contemporary?